Oh, oh, hello, I didn't see you there. You might be wondering why I'm playing with this padlock. Well, today we're talking enzymes. Before we get into why this padlock's relevant, let's go through what we've learned so far. So, so far we've learned about DNA RNA structure, we've learned about genes and chromosomes, transcription, translation, protein folding, and DNA replication. Now, if you haven't caught that series already, I, I really encourage you to have a look at each one of those videos. They're gonna really help everything we're about to learn make a bit more sense. So go back and watch those first um, and then come and watch these ones. So enzymes, padlocks, what do they have in common? Well, in 1894, uh, a person named Emil Fischer described enzymes as being a lock and key. And what that meant is that we had substrates that were specific to only certain enzymes or even just one enzyme and they had complementary shapes. So this particular substrate would only fit in this particular enzyme, and then something magical would happen and the enzyme would go to work. What was really interesting is once the substrate was removed and now became something different like a product, the enzyme was still the same. So how does that work? So enzymes are big macromolecules and they're biological catalysts. So what that means is they speed up chemical reactions and sometimes, Without this speeding up, those chemical reactions wouldn't even occur, particularly in the human body. Like all catalysts, enzymes do this by lowering the activation, lowering the activation energy needed for these uh, reactions to occur, and they don't get changed themselves. However, enzymes differ from other catalysts because they're very specific, okay? So they'll only generally work with just one substrate. Enzymes can also um, be affected by things like pH and heat, um, as well as inhibitors and things like that, which we'll get to in a later video. So here you can see a, an example of a big globular protein, which is an enzyme. So all enzymes are proteins, and therefore whatever things affect proteins can also affect enzymes. So here we've got a, an enzyme, and you can see that it's this big globular protein shape. However, if we were to draw that uh, diagrammatically, you can see that um, we've done that with sort of like a half circle with some sections that um, a substrate can fit into and it will be quite specific. When those substrates do bind, um, you will see a bit of a change to that enzyme, fits it a little bit more snugly and then a reaction can take place. And that's what we're gonna learn about today. Okay, so here I've drawn a, a diagram of an enzyme and a substrate. So our uh, substrate in green and our enzyme in red. So what you'll notice about that substrate and the enzyme is the enzyme has a space that looks very similar to the substrate, but it's complementary. So it's the inverse of that particular shape. So here's our enzyme, and that part that's complementary to our substrate is called the active site. We also have other sites on the enzyme that particularly won't be the active site for this particular uh, substrate, and we call that an allosteric site. Okay. And when we talk about uh, inhibitors, you know, that site will be uh, relevant as well. Okay, so now you can see that that substrate is going to move into our enzyme. And when that happens, we form an enzyme substrate complex. So the substrate has moved into the active site of the enzyme and forming this enzyme substrate complex. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we thought about a bit of a lock and key model, but in 1958, that lock and key model was revised and it's now called an induced fit model. So the lock and key described the complementary uh, shapes idea quite well, but it didn't actually describe the stabilization that occurs and the transition states that occur when the substrate and the enzyme bind together. So the induced fit model actually describes some of the relationships between um, the amino acids of the enzyme, those side chains and, and that whole three-dimensional structure better fitting to our substrate once the binding occurs. You can see we tighten up and then we start to form an enzyme product complex, which means that the enzyme is actually helping that reaction to take place. In this case, it's breaking our, two, it, breaking our substrate into two. So basically what that means is it just makes the enzyme substrate fit a little bit better and makes it um, less likely to be interfered with. Okay, that's all we really need to take away from that. Once the reaction takes place, the enzyme product complex, you can see we now have two products leave the active site and the active site 
um, reverts back to its normal state. The enzyme hasn't been changed in any way, but we've now got two products. The rate at which that happens is much faster than that substrate breaking down by itself. And in normal physiology, in just a normal biological system, that breakdown might never happen. There is some free energy, there is some uh, steady state energy within the system because of heat. However, if it's not high enough, then those substrates won't break down. And that's what we're talking about. We need enzymes to help those reactions take place. In later videos, we'll look at exactly what's happening with um, controlling that rate of reaction. But for now, that's all we need to know. Okay, so that's, that's our starting point. Uh, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you wanna find more, check us out on Anytime Education, either in the Facebook or online. Um, subscribe and you'll get all the updates for the videos. It's free. Um, and, uh, and again, hope you enjoyed the video.